Okay, that's everyone in and us recording now. Okay, so welcome everyone and welcome. This is our second of our um, the EAA um, invites talks, and it's my pleasure to invite to introduce Kate Darby. So Kate is a RBA chartered architect and a principal at Kate Darby Architects. She studied architecture at the Bartlett and at the Architectural Association and has combined practice with teaching since 1997. She's been leading an MArch design studio at the Welsh School of Architecture since 2012, looking at the connection between materials and place through the lens of making. She's interested in the idea of contem uh, contemporary vernacular. In 2018, she started the local adaptation unit with Gianni Botsford. Local adaptation is when a population of organisms has evolved to be more well suited to its environment than other members of the same species. Gianni and Kate seek the same outcome in architecture, an architecture of local adaption to climate, culture and context. She's been a, been a design tutor uh, for design and make at the AA in Hook Park and has led an undergraduate design unit at the Bartlett and taught MARC at Bath University. She's a founding member of the annual workshop Studio in the Woods and has been a collaborator in the design practice and physical studio. In 2017, Kate Darby and David Connor won the AJ Small Project Award for their project Crop Lodge Studio. This project also won the Arabi West Midlands Award and was a nominee in the Beasley Design of the Year 2017 awards hosted by the Design Museum. Kate's practice is based in, in this studio, which is shared with David Connor Design. It's located in rural Hertfordshire. Two projects uh, that are currently on the drawing board are converting a sheep shed in Mid Wales into an art gallery called Mid Wales Arts and 86 supported living apartments for the elderly in the south of France. So I'm going to pass you over to Kate and I'll switch my camera off. Kate, do you want to share your screen? Uh, yes, it's disappeared. Uh, that's okay. weird. Give me okay. a second. We tested it just now. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to just... Let's just try this again. Okay, are you well, seeing that yeah. full screen? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Kieran. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. So uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I suppose, really what interests me in architecture and what drives me. And I'm going to focus the talk today around three different places. Herefordshire, where I'm currently based. Um, the Wire Forest, which is just west of Birmingham and the south of France. And I'm going to uh, try and talk about these places and how they influence the architecture. But before I go into any detail, I want to kind of set the scene. I want to explain what it is that drives me as an architect, what I'm interested in. And one of my first influences and something which I still find very powerful is this book, which I'm sure um, any of you who are architects um, know about, Architecture Without Architects, um, by Bernard Rudovsky. And this book uh, goes, sort of represents lots of examples of vernacular architecture around the world, which are, have evolved over time. They haven't had architects, they haven't been designed as such. Um, they have been made and evolved and, and fine-tuned to the place in which they stand. I'm going to give you an example of uh, a, a kind of um, architecture without architects, which I find exciting and interesting, which is very local to me in a town called Leinster. This is a, a map from about 1825 of the market town of Leinster in England, in Herefordshire. And uh, most of the land that we're looking at was owned by a priory, um, a medieval priory, which um, leased or sold the land to individuals in the form of things called burgage plots, which were long slivers of land that had um, a, a narrow frontage on the high street so that people could sell their wares and engage with the, um, 
the sort of market activities of the high street, but they could then have access to land at the back where they could grow things and space for building workshops where they could make things. And this form is still very visible in Leominster today. And you can see that this is an architecture that hasn't been kind of designed or coordinated. It's very much evolved as a result of the first slicing up the land. It's um, influenced by the materials that it's built from. Um, it would be influenced by the finances and culture of the time, um, a need for light, practical requirements of the building. Um, there may have at some point been some kind of planning restrictions that began to influence the height, but that was most likely due to economy and structural um, performance that kind of limited that. So there are a lot of constraints that have limited and affected how this um, street facade has become and what it has become over time. But there, because of these kind of rules, they're legible within this fabric. And I find that really fascinating, that the set of constraints that becomes legible in a form of architecture, which hasn't been designed as such, there's no single author, but the collective whole has something incredibly beautiful about it that speaks of time and material and of the context in which it was made. And um, I suppose I'm interested in how can you do that? How can you achieve that kind of um, sensitivity to place uh, as a designer? You do um, bring, where you don't have the advantage of kind of hundreds of years of time on your side to evolve a project. So um, one starting point perhaps is to look at the material that's in the ground and this, this map, this ge geological map of Great Britain um, is incredibly varied and there's a texture and a beauty to it. And I wonder if it's possible that architecture could perhaps wreck this on the surface. And of course, vernacular architecture to a certain extent did. And this long slither of limestone that you can see crisscrossing England from Portland Bill where the cement is made, limestone is quarried where St Paul's Cathedral was, was quarried as a material and shipped to London, um, all the way through Bath, across the Cotswolds and all the way up to Hull, is a slither of limestone which is visible on the surface in the form of settlements and villages and, and sort of grander architecture such as Bath. Um, there are, there's a lovely book um, by a man called Brunskill who uh, mapped vernacular architecture around England and uh, identified where the materials for this vernacular architecture were, were kind of predominant, which was perhaps due to the geology, certainly in, in the case of what's dug out of the ground, but also um, influenced perhaps by geology, but what is growing on the ground. So these are local materials, which at the time of the building of these buildings would have been the cheapest material to hand and therefore uh, um, that was kind of what the local fabric was made out of and this again is our uh, local town of Leinster where you can see from the site um, location that it's in the timber walling area of England. We also fall on the boundary of brick and um, there's a lot of clay in the ground here and brick was was used all over um, the, all over England and Wales, certainly. And um, actually, I'm not quite sure why Wales isn't included because there's a lot of brick in South Wales. Um, but you can see the kind of swathe of the limestone up the diagonally up the centre of England, which is where it would have been easier to dig limestone out of the ground than bake clay. So I'm interested in traditional architecture, but I'm also um, uh, a woman of my time, not in any way nostalgic, I don't want to revert to medieval times. Um, I, I, I'd like to think of myself as a child of modernity. And I have always been drawn to, I suppose, form or material that are in, industrialized and precise and beautiful, uh, such as this Donald Judd sculpture. And um, I find it kind of difficult in a way to reconcile these two things and that's one of the I suppose kind of questions that I'm constantly asking in my work. 
Um, but I think there's also, it's quite a kind of pertinent time for us to be thinking about where the materials that we build our buildings from come from and how well they are designed for their locality. Because with climate change, we want to minimize the embodied energy of our buildings and therefore kind of using potentially local material is um, a way of reducing the amount of embodied energy from transport. Um, and it's also interesting that if you look at what Le Corbusier wrote about um, the ambition for, for modern architecture, for modernism, was that it would be an architecture that would apply its, its um, form and reflecting, I suppose, modern values across the whole world in a uniform way. And here he's, he's saying that you should, um, he says every nation builds houses for its own climate. At this time of international interpretation of scientific techniques, I propose one single building for nations and climates, the house with respiration exact. So he is effectively calling into being um, a desire for conditioning. And this is one of the kind of um, heavy users of energy and perhaps a, a, an architecture which is much more locally adaptive and precise to its place can be also a much lower energy architecture as well. Um, in terms of where materials come from, vernacular or the, the local material is no longer the cheap material. If you go to your local B&Q to buy some stone for your patio, it's likely to have come from India and not from the quarry up the road. Um, the local buildings are still making an attempt to kind of make reference to the traditional vernacular of the area, but these are likely to be stone slips which are stuck onto a blockwork building, reflecting perhaps a stone of the area, but as I said, maybe a stone slip from, from, um, from India, or maybe it's, it's a kind of concrete um, reproduction. Brick is likely to have come from Germany rather than a brickworks down the road or from the nearest field. This image shows two buildings, one which is 300 years old and one which is about three years old, uh, both in our local village. Um, the building in the foreground is the old one. Um, in the background is a timber frame building which is using some of the traditional techniques of the oak framing um, that we saw examples of earlier. But it's also got um, kingspan type insulation in instead, of, instead of wattle and daub within the uh, panels. Um, it's probably got quite a lot of steel work connecting the timbers together. And um, it's very much sort of representing a past architecture rather than using perhaps the um, knowledge and technology of today along with local materials. I think probably that oak is likely to have been um, grown in France um, rather than the UK as well, um, rather than the local forest. So I'm interested in this question of what is an appropriate vernacular and what are, how do we relate the building to place at a time when really it's, um, it's not economically viable to use a local material. In the teaching that I have been doing for many years now, um, I have been, I've shown this as an example of a, of a way in which again, traditional materials can not only, um, well, all materials have an impact on the landscape. It's just that most of us aren't aware of what that landscape in, impact is now. Um, this is a drawing of the Forest of Dean, and it's a forestry plan which shows the kind of growing for um, the oak that would have been used in galleons um, uh, in the sort of 18th and 19th, late um, sort of early 19th century before steel ships were being used. And this, so that landscape is, is what would have produced buildings such as these. Um, the galleons in the first place and then the knock-on effect of some of these timbers being used in crack barns and so on. So there's a there's a, a landscape form which is really what was necessary in order to produce the material and that produces a certain kind of forest with curved timbers, curving sort of branching trees quite spaced apart um, and it's got a, it's a kind of landscape which um, is quite familiar to us in 
in parts of the UK, the sort of elements of this managed forestry still visible because a lot of the forest that was originally planted for these, these galleons in the 19th century have just been um, left since they're no longer needed economically, they've been kind of left unmanaged um, and are no longer particularly uh, viable for producing timber. So I'm going to talk to you about some specific projects in which we've, I've been kind of testing or exploring some of these ideas. So first of all, Studio in the Woods is um, a workshop which was started by this man, Piers Taylor from Invisible Studio, who um, in 2006 called up some friends and said, we're fed up of doing paper architecture, let's make something. We want to kind of do things with our own hands. So, um, Ever since then, we've been doing an annual workshop where we look at making structures with a group of people who um, divide up into groups. We eat together, we discuss ideas, um, we have talks. We, um, we're, we're sort of nomadic, so we move around from place to place. And in this particular event, this building was about three feet deep in cow manure two weeks before the event started. And I love the fact that this agricultural building, which was, is still in you know, everyday use for um, keeping livestock, for storing grain, um, but could also be used for discussing really incredible architecture. So here is the late and great Ted Cullinan giving one of his famous talks. I don't know if any of you've been lucky enough to see him, but he would describe his architecture by drawing it in kind of real time in front of your eyes. And here he is beginning to draw the first detail of his own house in London, which was listed during his lifetime while he was still living in it, all made of timber. And he's talking about the importance of a timber detail that sheds water and that, that allows dripping off the facade. Um, and that's in that cow shed. So we, over the years, um, I work with Janny Botsford and we lead a group and we have made a number of different structures that are looking at measuring a particular kind of environmental feature of a place, normally sunlight, and constructing um, a piece of work that is a sort of direct representation of that environmental quality. And I'm going to talk to you specifically about this project because it's in a place where we have subsequently gone on to teach um, in the wire forest. And it's also an example of what we call constructed analysis, which is the kind of constructing of a real, uh, um, a real time measurement of a phenomena. So in this instance, what we have constructed is the volume that is always in sunlight throughout a day in July when, we, when the Studio in the Woods event is taking place. So there are shadows cast by the buildings that are moving throughout the day and um, we measured this um, and we constructed the form of that volume of light using the material that was grown on site from the forest. This is our palleted materials. Um, we didn't know, we knew what we were going to measure, but we didn't know what form it was going to take. So we wanted square section timber that could be stacked um, in any direction and could grow in any direction so that it, we could create a structure that was um, able to to fill the space of any form, a form that we didn't yet know what it was going to be before we ordered the material. These are oak, um, these are all cut from the oak of the wire forest, which I'm going to talk about more later. So here we are beginning to measure out um, the shadows. We've already been um, awake since um, five o'clock in the morning, which I think is when this first shadow was cast from the porter cabin here. And every hour um, or, or so we are measuring and recording the kind of moving edge of shadow. That process goes on throughout the day until we have a complete picture and a volume, which is at this moment in time described in string. As a group, we then stand back and we look at it and we say, right, we've discovered what the sunlight is doing and what the shadows are doing. Now, what do we want to build? What do we want to reveal about what we've discovered it might be interesting? So in this instance, we decided that it was interesting to cut to, to um, construct the volume of sunlight that was always there. So somewhere that there was never a shadow. And um, it's hard to 
it's not legible at this point, but those those yellow lines of string are kind of delineating the shadows. So we are going to be kind of constructing a volume around that space that is never in shadow for this particular day. So we slowly build up um, our structure. This is a structure that's kind of temporarily propped, um, effectively kind of bracing what is going to be a kind of orthogonally stacked structure that we're slowly accumulating. And um, this is what the final form looks like. So these pieces of structure are always in sunlight throughout this day. And this is something that we, looking at, found very kind of beautiful and interesting as a group. But the shadows cast by these, by the structure, but also cast by the structure onto itself was a kind of beautiful, was, a, was rather a beautiful phenomenon. And we knew that throughout this day in July, that phenomenon was gonna happen throughout the entire day because we knew that all the structure that we had made was going to be sitting in sunlight. And that was a piece of information about the place that um, we have thought subsequently is really interesting to explore how that can kind of evolve into an architecture um, that is occupiable um, rather than a kind of installation of an event. So um, this is the location of the Wire Forest. And Jani and I went on to spend a year with Cardiff students, um, master's students um, in the Wire Forest, looking at building on what we had learned from the constructive analysis. But before we started any designing, we wanted to really understand this place. So the Wire Forest is um, amazingly the largest contiguous um, ancient woodland in England, and it's only 26 miles from the centre of Birmingham. Um, it's uh, the piece of land within the forest that hosted Studio in the Woods and hosted the, our students for a year is owned by something called the Guild of St George, which was a trust set up or a guild set up and endowed by John Ruskin. And he was originally bequeathed the land by the mayor of Birmingham so that he could set up one of his utopian communities on this place. And a group of people moved here and lived in this little place called St George's Farm. This shows the kind of limits of their land where they tried to live a, a life according to Ruskinian principles. And um, this land is still owned um, by the Guild of St George, although the utopian community failed because they couldn't actually grow enough food on the heavy clay. And it, it ultimately fell into um, a standard agricultural leaseholding. Um, so, so we were interested in the students kind of understanding, I suppose, the ethos of, of John Ruskin. And um, we would get them to look at things like the seven lamps of architecture. Um, he himself designed a building which was to house his library on the site, which I think looks a bit like a mausoleum and doesn't fulfill, I don't think, many of the um, uh, ambitions that I have for kind of place specific architecture um, <laughs> in this kind of denuded landscape with peacocks. Um, but it's interesting to see. I mean, I think the value, his value is very much um, uh, um, that the work that I aspire to do and that I'm interested in, um, in many ways connect to uh, the Ruskinian values, but I'm not sure that this building demonstrate his values particularly well. So the wire forest was, was actually a huge um, coppiced oak charcoal plantation where there were these amazing structures in the woodland where people would um, make charcoal. And it was almost a kind of industrial scale that was feeding the black country and giving fuel before the invention of the railways and coal mining really replaced this activity. So the kind of early iron smelting that went on in the iron ore um, in, in uh, Colebrookdale and in the black country um, would have been fueled by charcoal from this place. And um, when charcoal was no longer kind of economically viable, the coppice stools were singled, as it was called, and 
individual oaks were allowed to grow from these copy stools. And this is what the woodland looks like today, or large, large parts of it. It's a monoculture of oak, it's incredibly unusual. The material of the trees have all grown up at the same speed and they've kind of stopped growing because they're, it's absolutely um, cram-packed. Um, the understory is relatively sparse and um, it's an, because it's an unmanaged landscape and because it hasn't um, evolved to this point naturally, um, it's actually kind of in this state, sort of relatively unbiodiverse and the material that have that the trees um, produce are full of shake they're very knotted they're very branchy and they're worth very very little and so 80 percent of this incredible oak which has taken 125 years to grow is actually being sold for firewood which i think is incredible and um, so there is now a new landscape management in uh, and forestry management management plan in place that is beginning to clear areas and allow new oak to grow up, which is bringing much greater biodiversity. But it's also yielding huge quantities of oak. Some of it, about 25% or 20% is, has value. And these are examples of, um, of logs that are going off to sawmills, which will have a kind of relatively high value for construction timber um, and may go on to build buildings like the one that I just showed you where they're still using traditional timber framing. But there's a huge amount of this material which is going to firewood and so we asked our students to kind of look at this problem and think about whether or not you could up value this material and they spent a lot of time looking at how it was milled and analyzing the amount of material that different cuts produce um, and obviously regularizing twisted and bent, rope, um, bent logs is very very um, wasteful in terms of material uh, you can see here that this is kind of examples of the of the sort of wasted material. But found that if you cut wide planks like this, you can extract um, quite a lot of short lengths of sort of three by three inch square section timber, and that became a starting point for thinking about this project that they then wanted to build. That we built as a kind of one to one live project on this land. Um, the Guild of St George wanted a. a um, a, a building to kind of announce the arrival onto the land of um, uh, uh, of this place, Ruskin Land, as it's called. And so this location was, or roughly this location was chosen as a place where a kind of folly or a, um, arrival point might begin. And our students were interested in creating a structural system that was very much derived from what we'd learned from the Studio in the Woods analysis. So um, a way of um, using lots and lots of small section timber, kind of two to three inch in section um, to create structure rather than the kind of long lengths of much um, wider section oaks that's used in traditional timber framing. So they came up with this idea that they would create a structure on this location here, circled in red. Um, there's a photograph of uh, roughly the site. And they wanted to create a structure which was going to, again, always be in sunlight so that it would be capturing sunlight, but it would also, the density of the structure would create shade. And they wanted the structure to be kind of finely tuned to this place so that the shadows cast by the surrounding context would influence the form, would have an impact on what the form was. So the shadow from the barn and the shadow from the trees were kind of calculated and measured. And these were done at times when they couldn't measure it themselves. And so we begin to start using digital tools and digital forms of analysis to find that information about a place that's very particular um, in a way that, uh, that we have learned to do at one-to-one -one from Studio in the Woods, that we've learned to do from actual measuring. We're now beginning to do it digitally. And since the students, um, drew these, we've now kind of evolved the tools much more, much more useful and much more precise using um, Grasshopper and, and tools like, and, and, and Rhino to actually um, calculate sunlight forms and exactly calculate where sunlight is going to be. So we've had, um, we've looked at the shadow cast by the context and the students wanted to create 
um, a hole in the middle of this structure that would let midday sunlight in um, in the winter. So this is a carving of the volume that would be occupied for, for the whole of the um, sort of three months of, of winter. Um, sunlight would be able to go through the hole in the center of this structure. So this is combining all three um, elements together. And this is a one to 10 model of the structure that they were ultimately going to build at one to one. And um, I think this model shows how the, this, this, this structure can both create shade and sunlight in different spaces in quite a kind of controlled way. So the idea is that this could have been, that this could be, this is a prototype, if you like, for a structural system for, for making um, larger scale buildings on this site, where you would be able to occupy the spaces that are carved out within this structure. Um, and the structure itself, you, you would have the kind of qualities of light within your within the space that you wanted, but the the structure, but you would look up into the structure and you'd kind of appreciate the 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 way that it caught the sunlight and the way that the shadows moved um, over time throughout the day. So this was the aspiration, this is the model. Um, we in order to arrive at this structure, there was a lot of prototyping, a lot of experimenting with material and a lot of conversation with an engineer. Um, so the, the kind of grid of structure was larger than the short pieces of timber that could be extracted from these curvy logs. So we looked with an engineer as the kind of rules that um, of overlap that you would need in order to extend overlap one piece of um, column or post with another. And we developed a set of rules um, that, that would enable us to understand the density of the structure, the quantity, the, the amount of overlap required and so on. Uh, a lot of joint prototyping took place. And in the end, the one that we went with is one on the far, far left, which involved no cutting into the timber whatsoever, but overlapping the timber and then pegging it into three paces, we found made a very stiff portal connection which meant that we didn't need any diagonal bracing in the structure. And um, it was also quite appropriate to our, the lack of, I mean, our students had high levels of digital skills, but very low levels of uh, carpentry skills. So this, this um, connection solution meant you didn't have to, and it's also very time consuming to cut joints into what is gonna be a, a structure with hundreds hundreds of joints and connections. So this was an efficient and time consuming way of placing, of connecting the timber together with quite a stiff portal connection. These steel pegs ultimately replaced with oak pegs. We worked with an engineer called Toby McLean who um, analyzed the structure that we were proposing in order to check, check that um, uh, that these portal connections were sufficiently stiff and that they that the structure would survive the wind loads that were predicted for it. And um, you can kind of see the weakest areas, um, but they were kind of deemed within reason for the structure. So the students um, had to figure out how to make this themselves. Um, they did all of the building themselves. And we think this is an incredibly valuable lesson in the education of an architect to kind of understand how things are made and to see how your knowledge of material actually influences not only the way you make something, but how you design it in the first place. So here we can see that there are, this is a frame um, that is, that the, the building is made up of a number of frames that, that um, go in different, I mean, uh, go, essentially the, the frames were constructed in one axis and then horizontal timbers were threaded through to connect these timbers in the other axis. So a series of flame, play, um, frames were made flat and you can see the overlapping timbers where um, this, this length was the kind of maximum length of timber that we could get out of the oak that was being milled on the site next to us. So we were able to mill the oak and kind of categorize um, and catalog the lengths of all the, the, um, the material that was coming out of the trees. And then these frames could be adapted accordingly. 
So the students had to kind of come up with their own way of their own form of construction drawings. And this is um, what they produced. And each, each of these gave them all the information that they needed to build the building. Um, they initially started pre-drilling all the holes in order to be fed into these frames. Um, but they found that the oak was shrinking so quickly that none of the holes lined up. So they needed to um, come up with kind of new drilling solutions in order to solve that problem. Um, they had to figure out how to make a round peg out of a piece of square peg. Um, they had to build and set out the foundations and tolerance was a really interesting issue because um, you know, they discovered that when you draw something at kind of incredibly precise scale in CAD, it's a very, very different um, animal when you come to bash a wobbly post into the ground and it hits a rock and it skews sideways and kind of seeing them understand all of this and be kind of despairing of it and then find a solution for it is a really exciting thing to witness and to be involved in as a teacher. So um, this is working kind of reactively to the um, a sort of irregular array, relatively irregular array of posts because they've all kind of gone off the grid and in order to fix the structure they had to make a flat face in the line poles and in order for the structure to be stable these faces had to be um, oriented in as many different directions as possible so that you, you had stability in both directions. Um, they initially planned to make the whole frame inside the workshop in parts and then to assemble the frames together outside. But they realized that that created a huge amount of extra work. So in the end, they ended up building a deck so that they could build things flat outside. So what you see there isn't a frame, but it's the deck on which they're gonna build a frame. And this shows the process of constructing frames, uh, lifting them into place with a telehander, fixing them to the foundations and slowly kind of hearing the structure in that way, going in kind of the Y direction and then threading horizontals through in the X direction in order to make the, 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 the um, structure stable. But um, until it was stable, we used a lot of temporary cross bracing that, um, that is completely kind of filling the holes. So you can't, the, what the structure is trying to reveal isn't at this point legible because it's filled with temporary bracing. But um, ultimately that bracing was removed once all the horizontal pieces had been in place. Once all of these oak pegs had been knocked into place and this is the resulting structure. And um, I could think it's from a simple um, starting point of a grid, it's amazing how different this grid appears depending on the viewpoint that you look at it from. So in some angles, it appears incredibly dense and in some angles, it appears incredibly kind of lightweight and thin. And um, this is after it's been in place for a few months and you can see that the timber is kind of grayed and the plants are beginning to grow up through it. And, um, and I think there's a kind of quality to this, although it's roughly made, it's made by unskilled carpenters. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot here you know, this is kind of machine made in a sense. Um, and there's probably a lot here that maybe Ruskin would disapprove of. But I think there's a kind of beauty in, um, I think there's also a, a echoing perhaps of the kind of vernacular architecture in that this is a building that's kind of accrued um, and evolved from many different hands making it and a lot of different kind of levels of skill. Um, the drawing, this photograph shows the kind of trees that are casting a shadow that are making carving out that area. And this shows it in context. And um, I mean, I'll talk later when I talk about our studio that form of building is something that people really hold dear and is, has a very kind of powerful um, influence, I suppose, impact on people's memory. And it's something that people argue about a lot. And um, the form of this is very alien to this place in many ways, but um, I think perhaps the material kind of connects it. And certainly if you're here on site and you see what the sun is doing, 
I think you, you, you understand a kind of connection to the place. So this is um, an experiment, a provocation, a question. I don't, I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm not saying this is the contemporary vernacular, but it's something that, um, it's one of the experiments that I've been engaged in to explore that, that topic. Um, just briefly, I realize that I'm going on far too long on this, but um, briefly, the tools that we are encouraging our students at Cardiff to use so that they can take an approach that we take in Studio in the Woods, but when you're not in this place and when you're, when you're not in real time, um, are incredibly useful to, to take this kind of locally adaptive approach. So one of them is 3D scanning. And this is a, oops, this is a, um, this is not working, typical, but this is a 3D scan of uh, a studio in the wood structure that we made the following year. And um, it would have been nice if you'd been able to see us moving through it. But I think, you know, it looks rather like a photograph, but this is actually a digitally accurate um, uh, point cloud model of um, a very complex environment of trees, of structure and so on. And this is something that students can cut sections with and they can, um, very, very accurately um, look at a place and look at a material. And this is an example of how a student has done just that, where he's made a 3D model of an individual tree. And he was interested in dissecting this tree and he did 3D prints of every, every single branch within this tree. And he wanted to make um, a piece of architecture that was very, very precisely using every one of these elements. Um, we use grasshopper as a way of kind of parametrically um, analyzing and um, I suppose evolving design proposals. So this is um, this is a model of sort of three, 365 days of sunlight in a very particular place, sunlight that's falling on the surface of water. Um, that's a model of sight from two different times coming through three different windows um, that isn't visible in real time, but has been modeled um, and 3D printed and shows kind of sunlight um, over combi combined time, if you like. Um, this student looked at um, modeling a brook in a wire forest, and he was interested in damming this brook in order to cr cr create a pond so that he could then reflect sunlight and look and capture the reflections of sunlight off water. And he developed this tool using grasshopper to analyze the best place to place a dam across this book, brook. And it's interesting that while we were there, we found out that there was a huge flood problem in Budley, the nearest town to the wire forest. And one of the flood prevention schemes that was being looked at was to place leaky dams on Dowell's brook, which is this brook that the student is analyzing. And um, these leaky dams would slow the progress of water in a heavy rain um, that's falling into the Dalles Brook Valley, it will slow its progress into the River Severn, which this runs into and which is, was flooding beautifully. And we discovered that this tool, tool would actually be a very, very useful way of analyzing the very best places to put a leaky dam so that you could collect, you could analyze where you could collect the most water. And you can see that from the same height of, of dam, um, you're getting very different shaped pools from just placing the same height wall in different places along this. So we're interested in the kind of way these tools can be used. And the same student then went on to analyze sunlight reflecting off this pond um, that was created from damming um, the brook and where he wanted to use the, the trees that would be have to be cut down in the area where th that would be flooded because ultimately they'd be killed by the flooding. And so, he wanted to analyze precisely how many trees would be removed, exactly the volume or the surface area of water, and ultimately the reflections that would bounce off that water throughout the year. And his project was to create a surface to kind of capture those reflections just within, within the wood, woodland, just before they would get lost into the underside of the trees. So to do that, he needed to map where those reflections ended up and he did it in plan that you've just seen and also in elevation that you can see here. So that's a very precise mapping of reflections off water 
over a particular period of time. And this ultimately was the kind of project that he proposed to capture those reflections made in wire forest timber. And um, very modest in comparison, but this is a project, this is just a new built house that I designed for somebody local to here using the wire forest oak as cladding and, um, and, I'm, and my kind of interest in how to use this material is ongoing from, you know, much more kind of conventional use of, of structure or, or cladding to um, the more sort of conceptual ideas we're, that we're exploring in our teaching. So um, the next project I want to talk about is in the south of France, and this is a new build project, and, um, and it's for a commercial developer, and it's got a very, very different set of constraints, um, which make it, I think, much, much harder for me to kind of, or for us to, work with the ideals that we are exploring or the interests that we have in, in kind of place specific architecture um, for many reasons, partly because of the context in which it's in, which is um, on it's this area here that you can see in blue. And um, this is the, this, this area that you're seeing is the conurbation of two settlements, Frejus on the left and Sarafel on the right, both of which were small modest fishing villages, um, probably, you know, not much more than a generation ago. Uh, 40 years ago, the site was in open countryside and um, it's really only been since the war, the Second World War, that the, that the town, that, that Sarafel has kind of grown and become a tourist resort. It sort of began to be a tourist resort before the, I suppose, between the wars after the First World War. And, it's this kind of tourism and the weather of the south of France that has made this whole area along the Mediterranean coast massively explode. And the default um, uh, form of urbanization, the default kind of urban morphology is suburban. Um, it's car based, um, it's wide apart as is an apartment blocks. Um, and there is very little connection to, I mean, the settlement on the left here is actually Roman in origin, and you can just about make out here that there's a Roman amphitheater. So there's this incredible kind of heritage in this place, but the majority of the built form that we see was built in the last 70 years. Um, this is the town plan, which is saying that the, the suburban development can cover all the red area. And um, what it's showing is that this is a, uh, a national park here. It's called the National Forest of the Esterel. It's been largely denuded by forest fire in the last sort of 20 years uh, or maybe 40 years in total. Um, but it's, it's, um, there's lots of kind of scrub and small indigenous uh, sort of oak trees and, and um, some conifer growing up on it. And our site is here and you can see that the town plan is preserving some land because it's floodable. This is along a stream and this is a big sort of floodable site here, which is being um, re uh, preserved as not buildable because of the flooding that it, um, the flooding threat. But there's also a kind of an ambition that you keep a natural sort of vegetation corridor that connects the center of the town here all the way into the National Forest. And this is a very, very beautiful place. There's this incredible um, sort of apricot pinkish colored rock um, that sticks out of the, of the, of the trees um, and is very kind of evocative of this place. This is one of the things that I think characterizes this place for me in particular. Um, just to give you in Edinburgh a sense of the scale of this site, um, this is the Edinburgh Architectural Association here. I'm afraid I don't know Edinburgh at all well, but I was amazed how black the roofs look um, in comparison to the roofs of, of uh, Frejus. Um, but it gives you an idea of just the difference in the, the kind of lack of density of the development here. These are houses and to the south of the site is kind of apartment blocks. And um, this is what the kind of roadscape looks like. It's, the site is probably less than a mile to the sea. And um, on a hot sunny day, it's a hellish walk if you want to go there. 
it's uh, there's absolutely no shade the roads are clogged with traffic producing fumes and um it's a very kind of unwalkable experience and that is something which um needs addressing i think in the kind of urbanization and it's it presents um it's not something that we can address in our site proposal but it's certainly something to kind of think about um the site is most valuable as a site for apartment blocks so in that kind of it's connecting to the kind of urban morph morphology of apartment blocks and and suburban roadscape but this is what the site looks like it's naturally very beautiful um, and as i mentioned before you know it does connect if you're a, a tortoise um, or a butterfly you can go all the way to the forest of the estorel within nature you can't physically walk there there's no public access along that route um, so we have made a proposal which is um, I forgot to mention actually that this, this is an unusual project in that we are stakeholders we have a share in this land we are stakeholders in it as owners not just architects it gives us a certain influence um, but ultimately the kind of way that this job is being or that this project is being designed and procured is it's being sold to a developer and it's a commercial project um, this is a scheme for um, uh, apartment blocks um, 50 percent of it is social housing so two of these blocks are social housing and two of them are free market housing and we have um, taken a model where the where we've I suppose the kind of diagram or the concept if you like is that we have these four pavilions that sit in a landscape that is kind of being retained as natural as possible um, that is that it's that's kind of wildness is retained and so we're trying to not change the slope of the site when we're trying to um, we're trying to keep existing vegetation where possible we will see that's a problem with that in a minute um, and we're trying to create a set of buildings which work with the existing climate um, in as low energy a way as possible so and I suppose to to make a place where people in each of their individual apartments can feel like they, they can have a kind of indoor outdoor existence uh, with big with relatively big sort of balconies and terraces and from those terraces they have as much privacy and a sense of isolation as possible so um, we have um, these relatively small um, uh, pavilion blocks that we call them um, enable us to do that because a lot of the majority of the apartments sit on the corner and it's a choice of where to put balconies um, and uh, each of these buildings has a kind of open atrium in the center through which you enter and circulate and that gives us an ability to have kind of cross ventilation and for each of these um, apartment blocks to benefit from that so <clears throat> These things show the strategy. You can see the void up the middle. You can see that there's a strategy. So every floor we're kind of staggering where the apartment, where the balconies go, so that so that people have a sense of of kind of isolation and sitting in this natural environment without um, without a kind of sense of an immediate neighbour. Um, whilst making the project as dense as possible, because obviously the denser it is, the higher the land value, and that's what. Um, landowners are interested in that's what developers are interested in this just shows a long section through the site there's an existing house little farmhouse um i say little it's it's um i mean it looks quite big compared to these apartment buildings but it's actually um not that big um and and this these sections kind of show how we're trying to retain the shape of the, the form of the ground um so not having kind of gardens and other kind of suppose um, suburban landscape paraphernalia but to design a building that the wild or natural land can go right up to and then in order to maximize the kind of value of the potential of the top floor we have a different plan on the top floor where the buildings the apartments kind of cantilever over the top of the of the block and take up um, 
you know, there's a greater amount of, of floor area on the top floor than there is on the ground on the first floor. And you can see this, this plan shows that, shows how we've kind of achieved that uh, at a slightly larger scale. You can see there's a kind of cantilever where this, where this apartment is a lot more valuable um, and we're, we're gaining a lot more surface or floor area by cantilevering it whilst still keeping that kind of ground plane open. And um, in order to make these buildings feel as undominant and as low as possible from the ground, um, we've created a roofscape which is curved, as you can see, and sits onto a, um, a sort of concrete plinth which, um, which stops at about a metre above or balustrade level above that top floor. So that the kind of feeling is that the top floor is really this height rather than the kind of recessed and set back um, roof at the top. And this, um, this gives you a sense of, of what those different apartment buildings might feel like and how the balconies act as kind of shading in some instances, but in other instances, we've added shading in order so that every outdoor space can be shaded. And just if you remember the image of the Estrel, I suppose, you know, our connection to place in this sense is, is, um, is looking at how we might make a kind of connection to the, to the, not the natural, I mean, it's possible that we could get some aggregate from quarries in the Estrel. And there's, it's a possibility that the, the, the masonry part of this building could kind of reflect the actual local material, but, but certainly kind of reflecting it um, in colour and um, making an association in that way rather than an actual local material. Because in reality, um, the cheapest way for them to build these buildings is going to be in concrete and um, and potentially any other material would, would make, would be too expensive. Although we've been looking at ways of making this project in timber and other ways that have much lower embodied energy. So, so there are kind of difficulties in making a project are um, really kind of connected to a place. But what, what we've tried to do here is take the attributes that are special of this place and, and kind of embed them in the building design. Um, just a point of making is that, you know, French building regs, rather like us, are at a point at which they're going to start taking into account embodied energy, but that isn't going to come into account for a, a couple of years. So at the moment, there's absolutely no commercial pressure that can be placed on the developer to make these buildings um, better performing in terms of the kind of embodied energy. Although I think the this design would make the energy use quite efficient because of the natural ventilation and the shading and the use of thermal mass. Um, so finally, I'm going to talk to you about a project of where I am at the moment. Um, I was asked to talk to you for an hour and I'm gonna go a little bit over that. So Kieran, do please tell me to hurry up if I'm going too slow. But um, this project um, again is very different and it's here where I'm sitting right now. Um, it's this, studio which I designed with my husband and sometime collaborator and co-worker David Connor who shares this space with me. He has his own practice, David Connor Design and, um, and we work together on this project and actually the, the French project we're working together on as well. I should have credited him because we've been co-designing um, that project together. So, um, so this is a a very different kind of animal. And um, here's David and I talking about our project. And I wanted to just talk about the different things that we both bring to this project briefly, because I think it's interesting that we've come from quite different backgrounds towards um, designing buildings. So David originally um, trained at the RCA and came to the RCA through art school route um, and through the interior design route. And he has a very different understanding of the kind of value of the surface of materials than I had before I did this project. So mine, as I've said, you know, I think you have a sense of where I'm coming from by now, but 
you know, this Studio in the Woods project is a classic example of, um, uh, of my interest in how the form of something might come from, um, is all about kind of how something is made and the, the logic of using a particular material. Whereas David was much more interested and is continues to be interested in the kind of narrative and the theatrical qualities of the potential of the surface of the material. And he recognized the kind of theatrical qualities of this project before I did. And um, it's really thanks to him that we went, that we were as extreme with our preservation as we were. So this is a project that he designed for Marco Peroni of the, of, um, the pop group Adam and the Ants. I don't know if any of you remember that group, but um, uh, yes, this is, this is a project that he designed for him. So we're here and this project, I, I want to kind of, this, this is very influenced by the place in which it is located in many different ways. So first of all, there is this agricultural hinterland you can just about make out the, the kind of urbanized form of Leinster to the south and Ludlow to the north, two market towns, um, which I think still economically probably um, are about, uh, I think agriculture is still the kind of highest um, uh, economic um, uh, contribution to those towns, just, but, but obviously they would have been um, grown out of agricultural production that would have been the kind of primary source of wealth that would have led to the creation of these places in the first place. Um, and out of this agricultural activity um, with farmers um, no longer needing the labour force that they do um, has grown lots of diversification type activities. So one of them is um, steelwork and making big agricultural sheds. So Leinster has got, believably, nine steel fabrication um, factories um, that do everything from pressing metal to making steel frame. And the first of those um, factories started just building big cow sheds and has kind of spawned a number of, um, you know, uh, any other steel framing or steel fabrication factories, which, which has become in a way the kind of new vernacular, it's the kind of new cheap material and it's, um, and it's very much connected to this agricultural setting. Um, the thing that's really important to this place is that we're on the edge of a huge piece of common land, which is an incredible privilege and a very and a kind of amazing space to be right on the edge of. And our studio is on that boundary and the building goes right up to that boundary and it's very important to us that we have a connection with that boundary. There's a number of, um, this is kind of typical of buildings that are on this common, a lot of black corrugated metal, um, which, has, um, which I've said is a kind of locally produced material. And this is the site where we are now. And you can see, um, well, it just looks like a, bunch, a clump of trees at the moment. The, uh, it's it's at the back of this building, which is listed, and as a result, this building was curtilage listed, and we were asked by the conservation officer to keep the building um, because he considered that enough of it was still standing. Um, that we were quite surprised by this. Our initial assumption was that we were going to demolish this 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 pile of rubble. I mean, it really didn't seem much more than that anyway. We were going to demolish it and we were going to build ourselves a little kind of contemporary architecture gem in a rural environment and that was our preconception but following the conversation with the um conversa conversation with the conservation officer um we realized that we had to change our thinking and we and we began to kind of think about ways in which this this could be a conservation project uh, this is the building that's listed that it's at the back of and this is it exposed a little bit more but you can see it's in a pretty bad state the conservation officer couldn't say that there was any one thing that was valuable valuable about it simply that it was probably 300 years old or at least parts of it were and that there was enough of it left to to keep 
So we came up with a strategy that if we were going to be forced to keep this building, then actually we were going to keep everything and um, everything about it was going to be valuable, not just the timber farm, which would be the normal to um, part of the building to preserve and which the conservation officer would have been quite happy for us to just keep the frame, was even happy for us to take it off site, have it repaired in a, in a carpentry shop and to be brought back and reassembled. And that would have been the only thing left of this building. But we decided that, um, I mean, for a start, that option was going to be more expensive, but it was also not going to keep anything that we thought was interesting about this project. So we came up with a strategy to create a new envelope around the old building that would do a number of things. It would structurally support the old building so that we didn't have to um, replace or support. We didn't have to kind of replace the, the decaying and rotting structure. It was going to create a new thermal envelope so that the building could be insulated and perform well. Um, and it would give us, it would also, it would also replace the original footprint. So it, in a way it's creating kind of, I suppose, ghost spaces of the old building that had completely collapsed. So by closely following the original footprint of the old building, the spaces in between the new envelope and the old building um, give you a kind of idea of what lapsed over time. So the envelope acts as a kind of datum of like. So here you can see we've got the common on the left and we were able to put a big window into this um, boundary wall, which um, I think if this wasn't a conservation project wouldn't have been allowed. We probably wouldn't have been allowed to build right up to the boundary. And this relationship is incredibly important. It's a really beautiful space. This is public land. We get animals and people walking right up to this, right up to this window. And um, this is where we work in this space here. So it's a lovely, it's lovely to kind of have an engagement with a public space, a rural public space. It's quite unusual. The red shows how much of the ruin was left and the black shows the new structure. So our strategy was to remove anything that was actually going to kind of fall off um, that was so loose that it was just going to kind of collapse once we kind of trimmed back the ivy. So we, we rented a cherry picker, we trimmed back the ivy, um, some of the kind of tiles that had been sort of resting on the ivy fell off. Um, but you're beginning to see what it is that we, we'd sort of pared back and decided that we could retain. And at this point, we're just propping the structure from the outside um, and propping it from the inside with acro props and kind of peeling back and seeing what we've got here. Um, it's a self-build project. So partly we were able to take time over it because we were doing this in our, in our spare time, employing um, individual subcontractors to do work for us um, with one person just working throughout the project on site, digging out floors by hand, carefully propping the building as required and um, kind of excavating uh, the, the parts of the building that we, that we weren't keeping, or uh, the parts of the ground that we weren't, weren't keeping and kind of peeling back um, the loose material that was on the outside of the building. So it was a difficult decision as to what to do with the floors. And in the end, we decided to dig them out. There, were, there was a sign of a little bit of cobble in one corner, which was really beautiful. And there were some flagstones. Um, but in order to make this building watertight and damp proof, we thought, and, and well insulated, there was so much to be gained by removing the floor, plus a little bit of extra ceiling, um, ceiling height on these incredibly low ceiling spaces. That in the end, we decided to remove those, those elements of floor that I just mentioned. So the floor is new, but you can see that the plinth walls have been retained and we decided to not try and put a DPC in here because we were measuring these with a damp, um, damp proof meter. We put a, a French drain all the way around the outside of the building. And over time, we could see that this ground was very, very dry. And we didn't need to put a DPC underneath those plinth walls, which would have really damaged them, we thought. It would have involved kind of taking them down and um, putting them back up again. So these flags, this is just an example of some of the flagstones that were in the floor that we've removed. Um, 
don't know why that's a squash drawing that's gone sideways, but it's an example or it would be of a drawing that we did for the project, but we actually did very few. It's quite interesting, but because we were instructing builders ourselves and we were on site all the time, we actually produced very few drawings. Um, the steel fabricator produced a drawing. Um, it was very difficult to figure out how to fit or how closely, what tolerance to allow to fit a perfectly um, precise steel frame over, over a kind of wobbly approximate rectangle of a building that was leaning in and out as you go up the up ram. Um, and we wanted this, the new building to kind of hug as closely as possible to the old building. So you can see we have aligned the um, a, a steel portal frame with the kind of key trusses, all of them except for this one, which is actually very well supported and didn't need extra support. Um, and then, um, and the steel frame, we were able to kind of invite the fabricator onto site because they were local and we could scratch our heads together and we could work out this problem of tolerance and we could, we could figure out what drawings we needed together. So this is one of the other very few drawings, but this is just showing a section of how we dealt with um, sitting over an existing retaining wall, the existing ground steps, so that you've got a change in level down here. And it was very important to us that we didn't change any of that. And we wanted to kind of keep the sort of light touch connection to the ground. Um, the whole building is wrapped in corrugated metal. So we wanted that a light to align all the way around. And we really just want to work that out as a front. So we did the drawings we needed to. Um, we were trying to kind of understand the tolerance issues in this section. Um, but that's really all, we, all that we produced, the drawings that we needed to. Um, we infilled the steel with a timber frame. Um, we did look at, we own a little bit of woodland next to the studio, and we did look at renting a, a mobile sawmill and milling our own timber, but it turned out to be much, much cheaper to buy ready treated timber that was probably grown in Siberia from our local timbers merchant. Um, and that's what we ended up using. And so we've got this kind of, you know, thinking about these things and in, in the end kind of abandoning it. Um, you know, perhaps if this was exposed and visible, we might have thought differently about it, but it's, it's a kind of interesting conundrum, you know, that it's some wood growing next to us is gonna be more expensive to use and would perform less well than this industrialized material. We aligned new openings with existing openings. So you can see that we've kind of created um, new openings to align. We also created openings where we wanted to have light and where there was kind of space in the structure to do so. So we tended to kind of create big square openings, which were the maximum size of a Velfat window with a single pane where we could, where we, where we wanted to introduce new openings, but they are otherwise, like here, we're, we are, um, fitting exactly to the um, existing um, uh, opening, the, the kind of the, the opening that was existing in the old room. Here you can see that there was another building that has, has collapsed even further here, and this is my project number two on the left. Um, the cladding, the cladding is all pressed in Leinster, so six miles down the road was where all this cladding came from. And that was really useful because we've actually made kind of bespoke flashings that fit around all of these windows because we didn't want to have, I mean, this is typical of the industrial shed flashing that would also be used on the verges and it would be used around the windows and all the openings. And we didn't want to have that kind of broad outline. We wanted this to make it look much more like the the barns that were on the com, which don't have any flashings because they don't worry if they let a bit of water blow up under the eaves or, or through the verges. Um, so being able to kind of prototype and work out a flashing that sits behind the corrugated cladding um, was, was great. We could pop down the road with a sketch, they could, they'd press something, we'd try it out, and then we'd go and modify it. Um, so there's a flashing that sort of sits behind here and collects any rainwater that blows in. And we were surprised that the conservation officer, I mean, we hadn't, we're not conservation architects and this was the first conservation project that we'd worked on. So we were quite surprised 
that conservation just means conserving something. We hadn't, we'd, we'd kind of anticipated that the conservation officer would want this, the kind of external um, uh, remaining ruin to, that's, that's sort of in the public domain, that's sort of visible from the public domain to be, to remain visible. But it turns out that he didn't care about that. He just wanted it to be preserved. So actually all of this is still there. It's all still within the building, but it's now covered in corrugated metal. So, um, and you know, it, in future generations, people can come and they can remove that metal if they if the cladding and it will all still be there. And so what you do see is the old building from the inside. And um, we had a lot of fine decisions to think about how do you add a new palette of materials to this interior in order to make it so that it doesn't, I suppose, compete with the kind of incredibly beautiful and rich pattern of weathering that we were so enjoying about the ruin that we were trying to preserve. Um, that was a material that perhaps kind of speaks of the local vernacular that using a kind of what would be a, a local vernacular, a local material, you know, what would that be? And in the end, we decided to use um, contemporary industrialized materials. So the, the ceiling is it's insulated with Kingspan. You can see Kingspan panels here. They're Kingspan seconds. Funnily enough, the Kingspan, this is actually a local material because Kingspan, one of the factories or the Kingspan insulation factory is a few miles up the road from us and their, their lorries go thundering down the road past our house every day, delivering to all parts of Europe. Um, anyway, so we decided to kind of clad the interior with white plasterboard um, to, to embed these window frames so that the blinds and any kind of paraphernalia is is all within the envelope so that it's a kind of as minimal um, a new surface as possible so that it so that we're maximizing the kind of potential I suppose of these industrial materials the kind of Donald Judd type materials if you like and but keeping it very much within a kind of within a within a the, the depth of the envelope itself and not allowing it to protrude. Um, we had the staircase fabricated by a, um, a, a steel fabricator in Ludlow. Um, for similar reasons, there are quite a few steel fabricators there. And we could go and um, work with them to, to sort of refine details, to figure out um, uh, we actually designed all of the details, these really horrible, disgusting drawings that I'm ashamed of, but I'm showing you because actually this is what the staircase was built on. Um, and they resulted from a three hour on-site um, design and brainstorming session with the fabricator, between me and the fabricator, where we looked at every single detail of a staircase that would be able to um, appear to be made out of a single material as though it was a kind of single, sheet material that's just folded and, and then we wanted to say it like the floor had just kind of been folded into a staircase but it all had to fit through a single um, rather small doorway because it was the last thing to be built and so it had to be demountable and we had to figure out a way to make something look like it was made of one material but to be demountable so you can see a kind of um, a welded flange here that this that the stringers sorry the um, treads um, sit on and this stringer here um, is a separate piece and there are, there are sort of count, um, little bolts or little screws in here with countersunk heads that fix it all together. We wanted the new layer to be as kind of invisible as possible so we were thinking how thin can we make our balustrade and this is the result a staircase that's kind of standing away from the wall um, that looks like a single material that's kind of the floor fold into a, to a staircase and that um, along with the plasterboard and these kind of minimal openings in the envelope in which the blinds are hidden, um, they become the kind of new layer, the new vernacular if you like, that, um, that's added to this building and everything else is retained and preserved absolutely exactly as it was. Here you can see a strap that is supporting this old oak truss um, back to the timber, back to the steel frame. And there's another example of a steel strap. 
And this is the strategy has enabled us to keep everything from the cobwebs to the ivy, to the bits of old dirt that are still kind of clinging to the structure. Um, but there have been places where we've had to temporarily, oh, sorry, not permanently prop and fix and kind of splice additional structure into the old building. And this is the way that we've done that. And these have all been made by a local farmer who has a welder in his lambing shed. And again, when he's not lambing, is making bits of sort of metal straps for us and little bits of kind of um, repair splicing to this building. Um, I just wanted to show you an example of, I mean, we, we have to kind of figure out where do we put the bathroom? Um, how do we hide a lot of new spaces within the structure that normally are dominant? So this is the bathroom hidden behind a kind of blank wall. Um, bathroom is made of very you know, precise orthogonal planes that are rectilinear and we wanted to be sitting horizontally. And they are fitting it, sitting into a context where nothing is straight and nothing is horizontal. So we had to design details that kind of covered, um, that took up this gap, this it took up the kind of difference between the horizontal and, and the kind of wonky. And so that's what this kind of um, angle is doing here. Um, and we had to hide um, things like, you know, shower into, into the sort of very, very narrow space or shallow floor that we created for ourselves. The kitchen went into this space and that we really want to retain all of this kind of incredible pattern. You can see there's a missing ceiling and we add a window. We do remove a piece of wall here and we decided that the kitchen should be like pieces of furniture that sat in place. And this is actually, these are IKEA units that have been wrapped by a steel fabricator, this time um, near Droitwich. So this was our kind of furthest away subcontractor, if you like. Um, but going back to black country routes, we were using. And you can see we've designed these so that they kind of stand away from the structure. Um, and the, this is, and the office looks a little bit different now, but this is this is our office space. I'm sitting from a chair, a table, a bit like this here, talking to you now. And this is the kind of ruin that we have observed. You can see that it's being propped here to give it a little bit of kind of additional lateral support. But other than that, that truss is kind of standing. Um, and what this has enabled us to do is to preserve all of the marks and patina um, from ev everything from the kind of traditional carpentry marks that you can see here. I don't know with, um, if the connection is good enough, but there's quite fine lines showing the traditional carpentry marks of the, um, uh, that, that would um, a carpenter would use in order to, I mean, you all know about this, but carpenter will use in order to um, reassemble his timber frame. But it also enables us to keep all of the marks that have been made subsequently by previous occupants of this place. I mean, who knows what was happening here when this counting was going on. You can see the kind of weathering. Um, there was a tin can that, uh, that was just left sitting on this piece of structure. And amazingly enough, um, our timber frame, our, our sort of car on-site carpenter who built this floor or this new ceiling right next to this wall um, was, so understood our desire to keep everything without touching it by this time that we built a whole floor here without moving this tin can. Um, this is David's favourite detail, he calls it bird's nest with conduit. Um, we can keep all of the ivy which was probably responsible for keeping, for destroying the building in the first place. Um, this uh, very beautiful old um, chimney with a bread oven um, you can see that there's a fireplace up in the air, which when you're standing in here, um, you don't immediately kind of recognize the oddity of that. But then you see the start, the, uh, uh, you don't recognize the oddity of the kind of void above your head here. But when you see this fireplace, you think um, that's odd, a fireplace up in the air. And then you realize that there's a floor that's kind of disappeared, that, that collapsed when the roof above it collapsed. And there are all these details which show you the story of the kind of weathering of this place. 
Um, we think that although this was clearly a cottage because it had a bread oven at some point, we think it was used as a as a stable, as a tap room for someone who kept horses, and that this is probably where the saddles were hung and the Hessian was maybe to protect the leather from the damp of the walls. Um, but we've added our new layer to this, a bit of modernist furniture. Um, you can see that here there are some um, steel wall, wall ties that someone had left when they were doing a building project, maybe from building a wall somewhere. Um, and we've now turned that into a light fitting and otherwise it's remained unmoved. When we have to open a window, we have to put our hands through the broken glass of this old um, sort of leaded window, um, which would have had beautiful little leaded lights at one point, but they're now all smashed, I'm afraid some of them by our children um, before we realized that this was a valuable piece of architecture. And you have to reach through this in order to open the new window. Um, this is a kind of before of that window as we were uncovering it. And this is what it looks like now after we'd removed that bit of ivy, which was very loose and about to collapse. Um, you can see here that this that there's a kind of double height space um, and there are little kind of clues, I suppose, of us. I mean, you know, the new insertions are kind of straight and horizontal and provide a datum for the, for the background of the old weathered material. Um, just very briefly, I'm very nearly at the end now, but this is a, an image that I particularly like because it shows this very, very beautiful um, uh, it's a bottom cord of this oak truss, which um, is hundreds of years old. And through the other side of this space, the other side of this wall is a little room, which really it would be very convenient for us to have a door in here. And at the moment, we have to climb a ladder in order to get to that space. But it would mean making a hole in this incredibly beautiful wall, which we don't want to do. And we're being very respectful and kind of reverent, revering the old structure. but. I don't know, maybe a hundred years ago, somebody wanted to put a door in this truss and they didn't give a damn. They just bashed a hole in it, put in a door. And somehow there's a kind of incredible beauty in that solution too. And these are opposite directions from the same landing, which I, which I enjoy every time I go up to the loo. So this is the final building. Um, by, being, by retaining the old building, we're forced to kind of live, it, live in it in a way that yields all sorts of surprises and different ways of engaging with the space, which we enjoy. And I suppose there is a form that has sat here on this site for probably 300 years, uh, a, a pitched roof that you can see is an, a, of an angle that was at that pitch, probably because it was thatched 300 years ago and needed a very steep pitch and is now clad in corrugated metal. And there was this kind of layered history um, and a connection to the place. But, it, but to me, it's got a kind of modernity and a relevance to my life now, and where I find, where I think I sit in the world um, that is combined somehow in this building. And that's it, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I've given you one minute to ask questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I um, just kind of wanted to make a, a, a couple of, I suppose, comments on, um, I found it really interesting how you move from the conversation with the studio in the woods, talking about um, analyzing, you, you know, uh, maximum sunlight, um, and that was, Kind of juxtaposed in the Fermoral Land project, where you're, you know, looking at shade, just the kind of concentration on sunlight, but such different environments. Um, and I uh, thank you for speaking so honestly about the um, France project as well, and the kind of developer commercial aspect of that, and trying to balance the ideas that you're able to explore in the studio of the woods in a commercial project. I thought that was really interesting. 
Um, and then obviously moving on to um, Croft Lodge Studio, which is such a fascinating project. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting to hear that your, your partner, David, in the background that he comes from, but it makes you understand the project so much more because it is like an abstract piece of art. Um, so that was that was interesting to to hear that side of it as well. Yeah, it really strongly feels like a piece of art, doesn't it? Okay. Do you do you see it as that as a piece of kind of sculpture, a bit of Rachel White read or? Uh... Yeah, I think I think we we both do. I mean, it feels like we're sort of in a museum, but it it is the main ex exhibit. You know, it's like living with a kind of museum exhibit, um, and a piece or a piece of art. I mean, it's the you know. There's a sort of overlap between these two things. I think where, um, you know, there's the, the clod of earth that hangs precariously under the old ivy in the, in the sort of sitting room, smug as we call it. I think, you know, that's the, it's that extreme preservation that David really pushed for and I think is so fantastic. That's where maybe it takes on the kind of art I think the other thing that, that joins all three projects is a kind of, they're all self-initiated, they're all entrepreneurial things where you're leading them, you're the client and the architect. Does that give you some freedom? It does. It gives us a huge amount of freedom. Um, I mean, for Croft Lodge Studio, it was, I don't think we would have, I mean, we're taking a lot of risk with this project. We're doing a lot of things experimentally for the first time that would be very difficult to um, persuade a client to do, I think, because um, because of the uncertainty involved. I mean, they would have had to have been uh, quite brave to take on the risk of, you know, we were taking on a risk of damp because, you know, essentially we've enclosed an old building in a completely sealed new envelope and we didn't really know what the ground was going to do. And so we've taken, um, you know, I mean, structurally, we ended up just sort of testing the structure um, by putting acro props under it and kind of jumping up and down. Um, you know, there are kind of, there are risks that we've taken this project that we wouldn't have been able to do. But I think the other thing is, as a self-initiated project, we could do it slowly and we could take our time. And that time was a real benefit because we could really we could, we could look closely at what we had to make sure that we didn't ride too roughshod over it. Um, and with the France project, um, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Actually, that project that I've shown you is now, I mean, I didn't go into it because of the length of time of the, that, that's available, but there's that, we're having to change that fundamentally. Um, and, but I think as a self, I think because we're a kind of stakeholder in the land, it gives us more opportunity to have that conversation about material and um, you know what's appropriate for site. But at the same time, we're, we are as pressurized as anybody by the commercial reality, because you know if we say we want it to be made of hand-hewn rock from the SRL, then they're going to say, well, we're not going to pay anything for the land. You can pay for that. Do you know, there's a sort of commercial reality which. I'm enjoying dealing with and um, but I think we do have opportunity because we can we can have we can broaden the conversation slightly and we can get clients to to kind of consider things like what the material should be rather than just work with the default solution. One of the things that scared me about your Croft Lodge studio was the the woodworm holes, and I wonder if that, <laughs> are those wood, woodworm, I don't know what's the plural, woodworm, are they still alive? Are they, are, they, are they extending into your timber frame or your furniture? Or So no sign of, of still alive woodworm. So before we enclosed, before we made the project airtight, we, we uh, treated all the timber. So we, you know, we treated it for woodworm and, um, and fungus and just by spraying it and then when it was enclosed and warmed up I think at that point it becomes inhospitable to worms so um, you know there isn't an issue so we sort of we had that kind of I think it was the double attack of killing it to start off with but then uh, you know very soon after that drying the whole structure out and, in, and enclosing it so that um, the woodworm can't come back. 
Well, it, doesn't, it doesn't like dry wood. What it um, makes me think of is, you know, when you have the, um, the old ships that are taken out of the sea and put in these huge buildings. Um, I, I don't know why, but that always, that's what it reminds me of. Um, yeah, the Mary Rose was a kind of something that we talked about quite a lot while we were, when we thought of this idea. So um, I also wanted to ask on the Croft Lodge, um, you spoke quite a bit about the um, uh, conversations that you had with the conservation officer. I'm wondering how uh, building control reaction was to what you were doing. Um, building control, remarkably relaxed. I mean, they we did it on a building notice, so they just came along and were you know, um, uh, was sort of happy to work with us. Um, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, weirdly, from both planning and building control point of view, it was one of our easiest projects. Um, uh, I, mean, I mean, that door, when it you've really, got, you have to step over the door and you would, I mean, I have to say, this is one of our frustrations in Scotland. Is the system here is so much less flexible than the English system, and so we would. I mean, I think. Sorry, sorry, go on. I didn't mean no, to no, you go. No, you go. Well, I was just going to say that the fact that it was, from a planning point of view, um, it's an annex to the existing house, and as such, doesn't you know? So therefore, it's a, it's treated as kind of domestic from a building control point of view and you know it and an existing building so I think they were just very very happy to um to take the reasonable approach with you know with, with things like you know the um step, stepping over the, the large threshold mm. um you know and all of the other issues you know not providing calculations and so on yeah I think I uh... Yeah, to me, like you could see from the photographs, you know, you've got your um, smoke detectors in, you've got all of your kind of um, modern day applications and appliances fitted into it. And then when you're looking at the conserved pieces, you, you feel that when you're in the building, you would take so much more care around those areas. And um, so, you know, do you think about the general dangers that building control flag up in buildings about, you know, scraping yourself on a, you know, a protruding nail or tripping over yeah. something. There's there's an element just about the, the the building and the way that it's being conserved that makes you treat it more as a preserved museum piece, I suppose, rather than like an average living space. I think, yeah. I think that's true because it does look very fragile when you're, you know, when you see it. Um, so I think you're right that that's, I mean, you know, one of the things that we were really, that was important to us, for instance, was to have a compliant staircase. I mean, a lot of architects, you know, particularly in their own homes, um, you know, get a building, get building control approval and then immediately take out the balustrade. But we really wanted to make something that was going to be safe and comply. Uh, but somehow, but still work with the kind of old fabric. Well, um, should we, have you got more questions, Kieran? Or no, I think that's good, yeah. I think we probably should uh, wrap up if that's all right, Kate. And, and just to say, unless anyone else wants to yeah, ask Yeah, I'm about, sorry, I went way over time. No, it's fine. It was really interesting, Kate. We really enjoyed having you talk, talk to us. And, and I know this is a big commitment for architects to come and talk. So, so thanks very much for giving up your time. And, and for taking time to talk yeah and that's it yeah um thank you everyone for, hopefully for one day i'll be able to visit you in person that'd yes. be great yeah welcome anytime excellent. yeah um yeah so thank you every um <laughs> very much everyone um take care and we hope to see you at our next event uh, good evening thank you bye